The myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus gives the fledgling philosopher the opportunity to become acquainted with concepts like meaninglessness, suicide, death, paradox, contradiction, and of course, the absurd. What a cheery bunch of ideas. Come on in. We're talking philosophy. I like to teach Albert Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus to beginning philosophy students. Uh, partly because I have so much of my own cultural foundation in Greek mythology, it's nice to see an old friend and uh, cultural hero appearing in the service of philosophy. And of course, I mean Sisyphus. Um, also, it turns students' expectations of the world upside down. Uh, no one has ever suggested to them that suicide is even a choice that you should make, let alone that it might be a problem. And yet Camus begins his article stating that there is only one serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. I don't know. I'm not entirely happy with that statement. At least I'm not entirely happy with his opening defense. Um, he suggests that suicide is important because it is a choice that we make regarding something worth dying for. Uh, he suggests, for example, that Galileo made the right choice in not becoming a martyr uh, for astronomy, uh, he, that there was nothing about the number of moons of Jupiter that even Jupiter had moons, or the rings of Saturn, or the orbits of the planets, that was worth dying for. Just not a big deal. The problem is people do pick reasons for dying that are, in my opinion, and I think in his, the wrong things to die for. Uh, nationalism, uh, the idea that this particular nation is more important than any other nation just seems wrong-headed to me. Uh, and I think it did to Camus. There are right reasons to protect your country, but just because it's got a name on the front of it doesn't make a difference. Likewise, religion. Uh, Camus was an atheist. He surely didn't think it was a good idea to die for your faith, since he would accept no faith. All faiths are wrong. Why is dying for it a good idea? And yet we know people died for their country, and we know people died for their faith. So I'm not completely sold on that particular defense of suicide. He does give us a slightly different look at it, and he suggests that the important thing about suicide is it gives us a way to answer the problem of the absurd. The absurd involves a contradiction. A lot of people take that to mean it's a paradox. It is not. A paradox is used to demonstrate that some central assumptions are mistaken, that either one of, or another thing can be true, but they both can't be true. Um, Russell's Paradox of the Barber is there to illustrate that some sorts of sets cannot be called well-formed sets. The Paradox of the Arrow in Zeno is not there to demonstrate that you can't understand the world, but rather the assumption of motion is faulty. This is not what Camus is trying to do. He's not trying to show that there are incompatible states of affairs in our assumptions. Rather, he's trying to suggest that the world has an intrinsic flaw in it, a flaw that makes our lives absurd. The flaw is that we all die. I had a student once who did, blew off a test, didn't give me a call, didn't make any effort to get in touch with me. After the class had been held, uh, I ran into the student on campus and she said to me, oh, I was protesting our treatment of Venezuela. 
I believe it was Venezuela. Could have been Honduras. Could have been Costa Rica. Anyway, she I thought I was out marching in the streets. I thought that was more important than attending a logic class. Well, looking back now, what Camus says is important, right? When he was talking to Galileo. On the one hand, I said to her, I agree. The behavior of our country, uh, your personal political interests, are of great importance to you. On the other hand, there have been countless wars throughout history. Wars which fought, killed more than this little skirmish we're involved in now ever will. Nobody even remembers the name of it, who died or where it was. Whereas the truths of logic will be around forever and always. Now, which one was more important? In a real sense, I was being sophistic. Human life is always more important. Always. But what can we do? Human life ends. It always ends. There is no escaping death. So we have to live. We have to do what it is we do. Even though we will die and our program will come to an end, our goals will be no more. Oh, the next generation you say carries forward. Mm, not really. It's that problem of translation. My goal, even though I've taught you my way of doing things, may turn out not to be your goal. You may not have understood it the way I meant for you to understand it. Things around us change, so the goal has to change. It has to move forward. My goals die with me. My program for life dies with me. Everything I do dies with me. And if it does not die on the day I die, it will die soon after. As I say, mighty kings led wars and battles across continents. Nobody knows their names now. Death is the one certain outcome. But we go on. And that is the absurd. Why do we go on? Is there a reason for going on? Should we go on? Hence, the problem of suicide. Shall we go on? Shall we continue to live? If we choose to do so, I know some of you must be thinking, he's not really the determinist we thought he was. I'm teaching you about what Camus thought. And Camus was an existentialist who believed in absolute freedom. In fact, one section of this essay is titled Absurd Freedom. So I'm telling you what he thinks, not what I think, okay? Or my understanding of him. Uh, we don't care what I think at this point about what I think about. This is not about me. This is about Camus. We choose to live. When we choose to live, says Camus, we must choose for a reason. Just choosing out of habit is not being true to the situation, not being honest to the situation. We should be able to offer some kind of reason why we live. And so he takes a look in the essay at several philosophers. I tend to concentrate on the outcomes rather than the reasons for these philosophers attempt to deal with why go on. And the outcome is this. You either posit some higher reality, some principle that organizes the universe from a philosophical metaphysical standpoint, or you take a leap 
into the unknown, believing faith that all will work out and that there is a reason you just don't know it. And he condemns both of these as being insincere, inadequate. Instead of looking at the absurd and facing it, you just say it doesn't exist. Somehow uh, a hereafter or a higher plane justifies dying here and now. How? Many people do not believe in death. Why? I don't know. It's right in front of their faces. But they don't. They believe that there is a continuation as we go forward. If there is a continuation as we go forward, then there is no death. As I see things, there is death. Certainly, the tree dies, the dog dies, your hopes die. They don't continue. They die. Even if death didn't mean the end of things, even if it only meant transferring to another state of affairs, the other state of affairs is completely alien to this one. And as such is the death of what we are doing now. Somehow, I have done enough good in the world or performed in a way according to my religious tradition well enough that I am entitled to go to paradise, whatever form paradise may take. When I arrive, my number one program is the one that I've always wanted to carry out back on earth that I was working on my whole lifetime, which is the seduction of a particular woman. Can I continue that program in the hereafter? Oh no, you'll be purged of all that kind of thing. Then I'm not me. Or at least the program of my life does not continue into the future. So death is real. The absurd is real. The evasion presented by jumping into religion or diving into a platonic greater reality, he says, evades without answering. So how do we answer? There is a freedom here and now, but there is no freedom at the end. At the end, we must all die. So what can we do? We can choose the path to death. And in choosing a path, we do not defeat the absurd. We cannot defeat the absurd. But we can render it ineffectual. We can give our lives meaning. Camus never really explains completely why he's chosen the myth of Sisyphus. I mean, he gives us some notions, he gives us some illusions. Let me give you my reading of why the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus is one of the most severely punished of prisoners in all of the Greek notion of the underworld, of hell. The only person I can think of coming close is Tantalus, who of course uh, served a human sacrifice to the gods, which at some point they had uh, a band. I don't know when, because certainly there were, uh, there were cases of sacrifice after the usual notion of when Tantalus lived. But Tantalus is, of course, 
can't bend over and get water when he drinks because the, the, the stream he stands in recedes when he bends over. Nor can he reach up and grab food off the tree because when he reaches to grab, the wind takes the tree away. So he's always can't eat, always can't drink, can't bend over, can't jump up. That's a wonderful torture. Sisyphus's torture is more sublime still, I think. Sisyphus represents the desire to live. Sisyphus fights against death. He even succeeds in fighting against death. The gods have to grant him an extended life because he has captured death and no one else is dying. So Sisyphus can't die. Well, the gods can't have nobody dying. So they cut a deal with Sisyphus. But in the end, Sisyphus must die. Despite all his ingenuity, despite all of his freedom in life, he cannot escape having to die. Now, the Greek notion of the afterlife was essentially a restful affair. Um, the, the best of life was to live in the Elysian fields and be able to relax and lay about, do nothing. If you want to get like Socrates and chatter to people, you can, nobody cares. Heroes didn't care for it. We're reminded of Achilles in uh, the Odyssey, who really doesn't care for the afterlife because there's nothing to do. I mean, you can't go killing people, you know, because they're already dead. You can't be heroic because nobody can die. Not their idea of a good time. But for the average person, the average individual, it's, it's, it's absolute bliss. Nothing to do except what you want to do. Nowhere to go except where you want to go. Nobody to deal with except who you want to deal with. But not for Sisyphus. Sisyphus has a job, a fixed job. He must push this boulder to the top of a hill. If he gets it to the top of the hill and over the crest, he'll be freed from his punishment forever. But he never gets it there. Always, at some point on the way up the hill, the boulder gets away from him and rolls back to the bottom. People always seem to want to imagine that boulder is as huge. Human beings can't move huge boulders like that. I always tend to think of it as Sisyphus in this permanent crouch, wheeling the boulder forward in little jerks in that crouched position, working his way up the hill. And then one time he pushes a little too hard or one time he doesn't get a good enough brace behind it and it goes off to the side. And down the hill it rolls. The interesting thing Camus says, it is in that moment when Sisyphus turns to go down the hill to get to that boulder, to shove it back up again, that Sisyphus is happy. We must think Sisyphus happy. Why? Why is so happy? Because for that moment, Sisyphus is returned to a state of freedom. Just till he gets to the foot of the hill. He is free to do as he pleases till he gets to the foot of the hill. What can he do? Well, he can't do anything. He has to go to the foot of the hill and start that boulder up again. He can't say, hey, I'm going on vacation, take a couple weeks. Nope, got to get back down there. But, but for that brief time, he's not doing anything that requires his attention, that requires his uh, physical presence. He's just walking down a hill to push the boulder back up again. He's not happy when he gets there. He's not happy when it slips away. He's happy coming down the hill during that moment of release. 
there is where he finds meaning. Why do I push the boulder up the hill? I am never going to get it there. I know I'm never going to get it there. But I push it up the hill because I have to. It's the way the world is. I'm going to die. Everything I do takes me closer to death. So why not just jump there with suicide? He says, because the program, the activity you get involved in, the way you choose to live, how you live, makes it worth staying alive for. It's not pushing the boulder up the hill. That's not it. Work, qua work, work as doing something is not where meaning comes from. It comes from that moment of release where I express me, when I realize the person I am, when I actualize my best possibilities, when I live according to the choices I have made. And that is what Sisyphus is doing, coming down that hill. He can stroll, he can dance, he can get down on his belly and crawl like a reptile. But he has to go down the hill. And getting down that hill is his moment of freedom, his moment of happiness. We're all condemned to die. But we don't have to live in an empty meaningless way. We can live according to our standards, our principles, and that is why Sisyphus is happy, and that is how we can not conquer the absurd, but at least render it ineffective in our lives. We can defend philosophically why I don't kill myself. If you like today's show, first of all, I hope you'll share it with your friends and they'll come and watch us too. Also, please consider clicking the like button down below. Also, think about subscribing so we can stay in touch and we can keep talking philosophy together. The executive producer of today's video is George Hales. If you want to get producer credit on my videos or otherwise support production of these videos, Go to patreon.com slash talking philosophy and find out how you can help. If you have watched at least five videos from this channel, I would like to list you as a friend of the channel. Please let me know the handle you'd like to use in the comments section. I'd also like to give a shout out to format consultant Nora Barnes, whose advice has helped me improve the look of our videos, and story consultant Andrew Beeman Caballaro, whose advice has helped me improve the storytelling in these videos. Uh, without either of these people, my experience would be a lot less rich, and so would yours.